Welcome to the History Guy Podcast, a podcast dedicated to stories of lesser-known historical events told by Lance Geiger, also known as the History Guy on YouTube. I'm Josh, your host, a writer for the channel and eldest son of the History Guy. We tell all kinds of stories about history, from the modern era to the ancient past, so you never know what we're going to talk about next. One thing you can be sure of, it is history that deserves to be remembered. This podcast of Forgotten History is brought to you by Magellan TV, a new kind of streaming service that aims to bring you the best documentaries from around the world. On today's episode, we're talking about two nuclear accidents. First, we talk about Operation Chrome Dome and the time that the United States accidentally dropped nuclear bombs on Spain in the Palomares incident. Next, the History Guy will tell the story of when a fallen wrench threatened to set off a nuke in Arkansas. Without further ado, let me introduce the History Guy. There was a period during the Cold War when tensions were so high that the United States kept nuclear-armed heavy bombers in the air 24-7. Every hour of the day there were bombers that were airborne, ready to drop their bombs under the belief that those bombers would guarantee a second strike capability even if a first strike by the Soviet Union had destroyed all of America's airfields. It was an amazing program carried on by our nation's armed forces, an astounding feat of logistics, but it did raise a problem because all of that flight time meant that accidents would occur, and if an accident occurred, then that would necessarily involve thermonuclear bombs. And it's perhaps a statement on how inured we become to the existence of nuclear weapons that the nation seems to have forgotten about the five, yes, five, airplane crashes involving thermonuclear bombs that occurred during the lifetime of the program that was called Operation Chrome Dome. It is history that deserves to be remembered. At the height of the Cold War, leaders sincerely feared their opponent would contemplate nuclear Armageddon and believed that nuclear war could only be avoided on a credible promise that if either side were to launch a first strike, they would inevitably be destroyed themselves as well. But that status quo was challenged with the advent of nuclear missiles and what the U.S. perceived to be a missile gap. For example, in the period 1961 to 1963, national intelligence estimates were that the Soviet Union had between 200 and 300 intercontinental ballistic missiles and 7 to 800 intermediate range missiles. That was enough that, intelligence estimated, the Soviet Union could destroy all the U.S. and Allied nuclear retaliatory forces, even if those forces were on ground alert. To fill the gap, the Allies needed to be able to have their strategic bombers respond more quickly than ground alert allowed. General Thomas S. Power, the Commander-in-Chief of the United States Strategic Air Command, pioneered the somewhat radical idea that the Air Force's new bomber, the B-52, could maintain 24-hour airborne alert duty. U.S. bombers carrying hydrogen bombs and all the codes and equipment needed to arm and deploy those bombs would be airborne at all times, loitering at strategic locations outside Soviet airspace where they could quickly retaliate or counter any threat. The idea was radical. It would press the equipment and the personnel in ways that had never been tested before. The idea of aerial refueling goes back to the 1920s. The first known in-flight refueling between two planes occurred on June 27, 1923, between two Airco DH-4B biplanes of the United States Army Air Service. Using this process, DH-4Bs were able to set a number of air endurance records in the early 1920s and later aircraft continued to experiment with the process and set endurance records through the 1930s. But these systems, despite their obvious potential, were still rudimentary and dangerous, and none were regularly utilized during the Second World War. You could say that the idea had truly achieved its potential when, from February 26th to March 3rd of 1949, an American B-50 Superfortress long-range heavy bomber named Lucky Lady 2 of the 43rd Bomb Wing flew non-stop around the world in 94 hours and 1 minute, a feat made possible by in-flight refueling. But in reality, the process for keeping heavy bombers in the air for long periods of time was already being tested by the Air Force prior to Lucky Lady 2's flight. SAC had been considering some version of air alert for years, but the technology was not considered to be ready. The first test of the concept was done in the spring of 1958 under the codename Operation Curtain Razor, using B-36 bombers of the 72nd Bomb Wing flying from Ramy Air Force Base in Puerto Rico. Then that winter, the test continued with Operation Head Start, using B-52 bombers of the 42nd Heavy Bomb Wing, first from Loring Air Force Base in Maine, and then from Bergstrom Air Force Base in Texas. 
The program required more than improving in-flight fueling techniques. They included researching maintenance schedules, crew schedules, flight paths, and even crew nutrition. To be sure, the program was controversial within the military and the government. General Curtis LeMay, who had previously been the director of the Strategic Air Command and, from 1957, was vice chief of staff of the United States Air Force, expressed concerns about cost, flexibility, crew fatigue, the ability to coordinate the plane's attack with other forces, competition with other Air Force priorities, and the impact on longevity of the B-52 bombers. Oddly, he did not list among his concerns the fear that there could be accidents involved with constantly operating heavy bombers carrying thermonuclear weapons. Certainly one of the most pressing issues of the technology was the in-flight refueling, which had not to that point been used on anything approaching this scale. The Lucky Lady 2 was refueled using the clumsy looped hose method in a modified B-29. The system depended upon the tanker using a sort of grappling hook to grab a cable let out by the receiver aircraft. The Air Force knew at the time the system was too clumsy for regular use. Next, the Air Force tested a probe and drogue system, where the tanker uses a flexible hose with a basket that goes over a probe on the receiver aircraft. While this is a far simpler system than the looped hose method and still widely used today and preferred by the U.S. Navy, the system has a limited flow rate due to the flexibility of the hose. Instead, the U.S. Air Force preferred a rigid flying boom, where an extendable boom is maneuvered into a receptacle on the receiving aircraft. But even with this system, the Air Force had a problem with their tanker aircraft. The KB-29 and its replacement, the KC-97 Stratofreighter, were both developments of the Boeing B-29. As piston-driven aircraft, they were too slow for jet aircraft, causing many problems and risks in refueling. A B-52 typically had to raise its flaps and lower its landing gear to slow down enough for aerial refueling. In addition, the piston-driven aircraft required a reduction in altitude to around 16 to 18,000 feet, which often put the bombers right in the clouds and turbulence as they were being refueled. In 1957, the Air Force started phasing in the Boeing KC-135 Stratotanker. Based on the Boeing 707, the KC-135 was the Air Force's first jet-powered refueling tanker. Finally, the Air Force had a workable system to practically allow airborne alert duty. Despite continued concerns by the Air Force about costs, SAC continued to fly fully prepared nuclear-armed strategic bombers in the air around the clock for the next decade. The broader program became called Operation Chrome Dome. Operation Chrome Dome might have as many as a dozen bombers in the air and ready to strike at any time of the day or night. A typical Chrome Dome mission, which might be flown by one B-52 or a group of three called a cell, would take off from Fairchild Air Force Base near Spokane, Washington, across the U.S. to the Atlantic Ocean, up to the Arctic Circle, turn towards Alaska, and then back to Fairchild. The mission would take around 24 hours and include two in-flight refuelings. Crews quickly became adept at the system. But Chrome Dome meant a huge amount of flight hours. Over 6,000 airborne alert missions had been flown by 1961. With that much flying, things would certainly go wrong. While the program was itself no secret, General Power had announced the operation publicly as the purpose was deterrence, the Air Force was characteristically obtuse to the public about the risks. A quotation from SAC in Time Magazine in 1961 said, At worst, only the TNT in an unarmed H-bomb explodes on impact. The first accident involving nuclear bombs of Operation Chrome Dome came January 24, 1961, over Goldsboro, North Carolina. A B-52G experienced a fuel leak that evolved into a structural problem, causing the crew to lose control of the aircraft. Five of the crew bailed out safely, three died. One of the two nuclear bombs on board was recovered, and another buried itself so deeply in a field that it could not be recovered. The Air Force bought an easement on the land, and much of the bomb is still buried there today. Neither of the bomb's high explosive components had exploded and no radiation was released. But the bombs had progressed through much of their arming sequences, moving them dangerously close to a nuclear detonation. Experts still disagree as to the extent of that possibility. Flaws were fine in the design of the wet wing of the B-52 design to hold fuel and the areas susceptible to fatigue were modified to improve stability. Two months later, in March, a series of mechanical failures and crew mistakes caused a B-52F to run out of fuel near Yuba City, California. The crew all managed to eject from the plane safely, and the plane crashed into a clear, flat barley field. The onboard nuclear weapons were released, but their safety interlocks held, and there was no explosion or release of radiation. 
A third crash during Operation Chrome Dome occurred in January 1964, when the stabilizer of a B-52B broke off in rough weather. The plane crashed in rough territory near Savage Mountain, Maryland. One crew member was unable to eject, and two more froze to death after bailing out of the plane. The nuclear bombs, however, were recovered relatively intact. Three accidents was not a surprise given the large amount of flight time involved in Operation Chrome Dome, but none of those three accidents had resulted in any radiation loss or even the explosion of the high explosives on the nuclear warheads. But that luck would run out on January 17, 1966. A B-52G flying from Seymour Johnson Air Force Base in North Carolina was flying the southern route of Operation Chrome Dome, which took it across the Atlantic, over Spain, and into the Mediterranean before returning home by Gibraltar. During the second refueling off the coast of Spain, the B-52 came in too fast. The boom operator did not, reportedly, call for the B-52 to break away. The B-52 struck the boom. The collision severed the left wing of the B-52, causing a fuel explosion that destroyed the KC-135, killing all four crew members aboard. Two members of the B-52 crew were located near the point of the collision and were not able to eject. A third ejected, but his chute did not open. The B-52 radar navigator suffered severe burns, but landed safely and was taken to the hospital. Three other crew members safely ejected, but they landed in the ocean, where they were rescued by fishermen. On board the disintegrating aircraft were four Mark 28 hydrogen bombs. Three fell to the earth near the Spanish village of Palomares. The fourth fell into the ocean. One of the three landed via parachute and was intact, but the conventional explosives on the other two exploded on impact, causing radioactive contamination across some 2.6 square miles of farmland, woods, and residential areas, dispersing some 7 pounds of plutonium-239, a dangerous and toxic carcinogen. Air Force personnel were rushed from U.S. Air Force bases across Spain to aid in the cleanup. The U.S. and Spain dug up 6,000 barrels of contaminated soil and shifted back to the United States. The Air Force called for the assistance of the Navy to recover the fourth bomb. Nearly 30 Navy vessels were involved in the search, which took more than two months, despite having a witness who saw the bomb hit the water. The bomb was eventually recovered using some of the highest technology recover vehicles in the Navy the submarine recovery ship USS Petrel, the deep submergent vehicle Alvin, and the cable-controlled undersea recovery vehicle Curve-1. After the accident, Spain forbade the U.S. Air Force from overflying Spanish territory with aircraft carrying nuclear weapons, and other countries issued complaints as well. Operation Chrome Dome was ended two years later in 1968 when a fifth accident occurred, this one also releasing radioactive material, this time in Greenland. Despite the cleanup, more radioactive material was found near Palomares in 2006 and then at another site in 2008, and the United States and Spain have entered into another agreement to do further monitoring and cleanup at the site. Both governments claim that they found no ill health effects for the people of Palomares as a result of the incident, but other experts argue that the site has been poorly monitored and that the health effects are still unknown. The empty casings of two of the bombs involved in this incident are now on display in the National Museum of Nuclear Science and History in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Air Force personnel who were involved in the cleanup now claim a number of lingering health effects that they claim came from inadequate safety procedures. The Air Force has denied any such links and secrecy surrounding the event has made it difficult for the personnel who have been so affected to claim benefits. In the end, it's not a surprise that Operation Chrome Dome resulted in accidents. It was a very ambitious program that kept nuclear-armed bombers in the air around the clock for a decade. It, it was almost certainly going to lead to some accidents. But in fairness to the program, we cannot know the effect that it had on nuclear deterrence during the tensest periods of the Cold War. Operation Chrome Dome might well have prevented nuclear Armageddon. Still, the five accidents of Operation Chrome Dome remind us that no system is perfect, and that is important to know in the nuclear age. It is history that deserves to be remembered. Now's the part of the podcast where we get to chat with the history guy, talk a little bit about what we just heard, what we're going to hear, and some behind-the-scenes stuff that you only get to hear about on the podcast. But one thing I've learned while watching the YouTube channel is that nuclear accidents are probably not as rare as we'd like them to be. We have a lot of nuclear weapons in the world and there are accidents, as I think happens in almost any business. And it just happens that when you're working with nuclear bomb that the, the repercussions for an accident are pretty large. 
I actually read a book about the Palomares incident by a journalist who was there. I think he was a British journalist because he was making fun of American journalists too. Uh, it was called The Day They Lost the H-Bomb. And the officials, when I mean, who were actually there, the American officials, were reticent to let anyone know what had actually happened. He makes this comment of where they had actually managed to get one to say that he was not allowed to comment on what he couldn't comment on. It's, I understand why the United States, perhaps, in these, if we accidentally drop a bunch of nukes like we did here, that you don't want people to necessarily know that. But also, they kind of did know, and it ends up making it look just funny that the United States is saying, no, 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 we didn't, yeah, they had, we, we didn't drop anything. Well, I mean, there's a lot of reason for that. I mean, and it's, first of all, it's policy. I mean, everybody there reports yeah. up to someone. So, I mean, that decision wasn't necessarily made from the top. I mean, the, the top just said never anybody talked about it. No one was going to talk about it. There's times that it really doesn't make sense. I mean, we've talked about a few of them here. I mean, the, the, uh, they're not telling people that are civil defense officials nearby whether they need to be evacuated. Uh, but you can very much see why they were so concerned about it. I mean, the people in Spain didn't know they were overflying with nuclear missiles. They had no idea that these bases in Spain, including the, the, I'm sure the Spanish government did, but I mean, the, the people yeah. didn't. The people would have protested if they did it. So there's, there's reasons that we were keeping that stuff secret. I mean, in terms of the accidents, if you think about it, over the percentage of time and what's going on, and the fact that the fail-safes have always held, that we've never had an accidental nuclear detonation, uh, I, I think you can say that the system is kind of surprisingly safe. I mean, some of the, the stuff that we're talking about today, uh, we've added quite a bit of safeguards since then. But if you think about Operation Chrome Down, I mean, for decades, we had nuclear bombers in the air all the time uh, because we thought that was necessary for a credible deterrent. And for that to be a credible deterrent, they had to have everything they needed on that plane to be able to drop and detonate large nuclear bombs. Uh, and so that meant that you had 24-7 at any given time. You had multiple bombers carrying multiple bombs, nuclear explosives, thermonuclear explosives, with everything at least on the plane that would be needed to drop that. And, and never did Slim Pickens ride one out the bottom of the plane and accidentally blow up the world. So if, if you think about the Palomares incident, and there, and there were, uh, in, in that episode, I think there were, there were, there were five, I think, uh, uh, nuclear accidents that were related to Operation Chrome Down. Uh, if, if you think about that, I mean, uh, every time one of those planes went up, they were going to have multiple in-air refueling. And the Air Force uses a, a boom that is a, 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 a rigid boom. They don't use a, a tube. The Navy uses a hose. Uh, the Air Force uses a rigid boom, and that's because you could transfer a lot more fuel with a rigid boom. The Navy's mostly flying smaller airplanes. You wouldn't want to try to fill up a, a B-52 with a hose. But the way that that accident occurred off of Spain, you say that every single time you do that, you have two crews in very large aircraft that have to maintain a very small level of tolerance difference uh, in order to prevent happening what happened there over Spain. How did that only happen once over the entire career of Operation Chrome Down when they would have been every single day doing multiple refuelings of these bombers all over the world? So I, you know, I would say that actually they are, if you look at the, at the numbers as percentages, they are exceedingly rare. But you're right, you only need one. Uh, but, I mean, well, we've, we've never had one. You don't put a bar, part of the bomb that allows the bomb to become a nuclear detonation in the bomb unless you're planning to go use the bomb. We've never done that. But it, it is also astounding ready. how just straight up dishonest they will be. I mean, they will tell you, to, I mean, they know they're lying, you know they're lying, everybody knows they're lying. Uh, and, and they still simply won't tell you what's going on. And, that, and we've heard that time and again in these, in these nuclear no misses. Uh, where they, they were asked, <clears throat> and they would simply say, we can neither confirm nor deny. You can say that's for national security purposes, uh, because we don't want an, our enemies to know what we're capable of or whatever, but I mean, clearly that's all for PR purposes, because they're afraid of the repercussions to the military if people find out that we're having accidents with these weapons. Well, the Palomares incident was serious. I mean, even though none, of, even though none of the bombs went off, they did actually have some radiation leak. Which yeah. is, I mean, that's that's always the risk. Is that it's that you're, yeah. uh, uh, there's there's very rarely anything that could be credibly a risk of a detonation. We'll talk about the Damascus incident in a moment, but uh, but yeah. in in terms of these, the, the the real risk is simply that you do have nuclear material inside there that that can cause radi very small amounts of this radiation can, can be deadly, can cause cancer. Uh, and in, in Palomares, it certainly, I mean, they moved tons and tons of soil, packed it off, put it in buckets, <laughs> moved it to Georgia. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and But they also had U.S. Air Force personnel 
they just put them, you know, arm's length apart and walk through the field and pick up anything you find. And they weren't wearing protective equipment. They were just, they were literally picking up pieces of a nuclear bomb with their bare hands, putting them in garbage bags, and those you know, were contaminated with, with nuclear material. There have been some arguments. It might not be as, as immediately deadly as some portray it as, but it's awfully hard to tell how much long-term health effects in both Spain and to those Air Force personnel were the result of that. And of course, the Air Force yeah. doesn't want to pay for that. And so the Air Force is going to tell you it's not them. Uh, so it's it's it really is. You see all the you know all the really seamy underside, and it's not hard to find a seamy underside of you know mutually assured destruction and you know different sides with nuclear bombs ready to blow each other up. Uh, I mean, it, uh, clearly the whole world saw the seamy underside of the fact that we got to this point between the east and west yeah. or whatever. But you really see the seamy underside of the politics of what it took to have bases where they were so that we could support these missions. That if we knew everybody knew about, uh, it wasn't it wasn't just that we were afraid the Russians would know about them. We wanted the Russians to know about them because the whole point was that it's a credible threat, right? We wanted the Russians to know that bombers could hit them before they could hit us and keep mutually assured destruction. But uh, especially in in many parts of Europe, those were running into peace movements. We just we just straight up were certainly with the direct involvement of their government or tacit involvement of their government or maybe the involvement of their military with keeping their government to, in the dark. A lot of different ways. Uh, we were just straight up misrepresenting what was going on to people who, who would never have stood for it if they knew what was going on. And, and we, we see that, I mean, you see it lots and, and lots of times. It's surprising how many times that we see that. Uh, in the, uh, we talked about one in Grand Forks, North Dakota, that, you know, the mayor is asking, you know, what's going on there? Should I be evacuating the town? And they won't tell the local civil defense official, in, and this is an American town, you know, next to an American air base, and they won't tell the local civil defense official you know, whether they, they need to be considering evacuation. And of course, the most comic one comes up in the Damascus instance, where they wouldn't tell a vice president. <laughs> Your clearance is not high enough. You're not. I'm the vice president of the United States. Yeah, no, I can neither confirm nor deny what's going, what's going on here. In these episodes, I mean, we talk about, you know, what would have happened if there had been a nuclear detonation, because that's, you know, that's part of the drama of the era. But I, it, people rightfully will say on, you know, as, as they talk about these episodes, the, the possibility of nuclear detonation is actually extraordinarily remote, uh, though extraordinarily remote is still scary when, you, when you know, the, the impact would be extraordinarily bad. But yeah. mostly the risk is really the risk that we had at Palomares, and that is that you're going to contaminate several square miles of, of yeah. arable land. Uh, and that's, you know, depends how popular, but many people at risk over decades of exposure. Yeah, which is why they took all the soil out. Supposedly, that's you know preventing. Yeah, some but of that. I mean, but it's they still find we... every time you do that, you end up finding residual. I, I, that's, I yeah. don't know how much we talked about that in lots of places, and and uh, in that same episode, right, they, they just dropped one in the mud in North Carolina, and it was so deep in the mud they couldn't dig it out of there because the mud kept classing. And so they just they, basically... they just put the mud back on top of it, got an easement over that little spot, put a little fence around it, and said, you know, I don't dig here. Mm -hmm. Don't take care. And, and as far as we know, the, all the visible parts, all the parts of the bomb that would make a bomb are still down there somewhere. Yeah, just it shouldn't explode. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, not gonna, it's not going to detonate. But I mean, who knows, you know, if, I, if there's some ill effect to the soil to having that material in there. I mean, you know, the experts are going to tell us that's why we buried it. But I mean, but I mean, there's only there's only so much you can do for safety. And so, so yeah. I, I think it, it's extraordinary what these crews did. I think that they are truly heroes because they were truly serving their nations and they were putting their lives at risk. And every time they got on a bomber, they didn't know if that would be the time when they might be asked to, you know, do something horrible and very likely not have anything to come home to, uh, you know, assuming that they, that they didn't die in the attempt. Uh, and so, you know, these are people that were true patriots and that, that um, you know, risked their lives and, and, and did everything that you want to thank a veteran for. They were away from their families, all with the idea that they were preventing the most horrible thing you know that could happen. I mean, that's that's how they saw it. Uh, and I think that they did a fantastic job, an amazing job, if you think about what it took for everybody to keep those planes in the air, uh, to keep them fueled, and to operate them. I mean, everybody on, in that whole process uh, that we had as few accidents as we actually actually had. But you just cannot have airplanes in the air 24-7 for decades at a time and not have some of them, you know, have accidents. Yeah. Just a lot of chances for accidents. And it, um, I, I understand when this this book that I read was written very shortly after the event. And so one of, one of the things I remember is that he, you know, speculated about stuff. And 
like now I, you know, with the benefit of being 50 years in the future, I was like, well, none of that happened or that did happen or something different happened. But he, I guess coming from him as a member of the press, he was very, I mean, he was very anti the whole fact that we just wouldn't say anything. And that even as we're shoveling out uh, soil, which was a pretty clear indication that there was a radi that there, we at least feared that there was radiation, that they're like, is there radiation in the soil? And they're like, we can't, we can neither confirm you know they, they still when they spin that they will tell you no the soil was really not dangerous we just did that to placate yeah. the spanish they demanded uh, as a safety measure but it really wasn't a risk to anyone uh, and e you know even now there's still some arguing that, that we're seeing long-term exposure effects in, in that part of spain an interest, interesting controversy too, and there's i mean i couldn't talk about everything i really wanted to in that episode because there was a lot to talk about uh, the recovery actually of the one that landed in the ocean was quite interesting the first time we used yeah. some some extraordinary recovery vehicles but it's interesting that another controversy that came out of that is that the fisherman who saw it go on the water uh, never felt that he was appropriately compensated for the finder's fee for pointing out where the nuclear bomb went. At which was in, it was important. I remember it, even in the reading of it that when that when that one went under, I mean, we searched for it and searched for it and we couldn't find yeah, it. Yeah, we had no idea we where it went. Yeah. We did not know where it went. And so the fact that we had this one guy who had seen it, I mean, was a big deal and it ended it up is. being the only reason that but we were I, able and to And I don't know. It. I hope you don't want to come back and sue me when I say, what kind of person says, you know, how much can I get for that? <laughs> That's your first thought. <laughs> <That's>... Ooh, <laughs> I'm going to be rich. <laughs> that, that feels... It feels a bit exploit exploitive, right? I mean, is it just yeah, me? Yeah, I, <laughs> I, 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 I think I would happily I don't know tell that. the Air Force, yeah, it's over there. <laughs> I, don't yeah, I wouldn't expect. I don't want to sit around. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm not like, oh, well, I won't tell you unless you yeah, pay me a million how, dollars. How much is it worth to you? I, I just, I don't think that's the first thing that comes to mind with me. So, I, you know, I honestly don't know what he, you know, what business he sacrificed in order to go there. For that. I mean, I, I might be signing yeah. a guy. I really don't know, but it does seem interesting. Interesting that uh, he essentially thought that there should be a finder's fee that would be a percentage of either the cost of the bomb. Or a percentage of the, of, you know, the damage the bomb would have done if it had gone off, or something like that. And, you know, I, 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 I don't know. I mean, that it's weird that know. that was where the lawsuit. It's not what I would have anticipated. I would have thought that its lawsuit was going to be the people that said, "Hey, you dropped a nuclear bomb on my farm." You know? Did they end up? Did they end up saying that the we couldn't fly over Spanish airspace after that? Yeah, they did end the... up limiting uh, Spanish airspace. We couldn't fly over with with bombs, and we had to change the the routes. But uh, and you know, how much of Europe were we flying over without? You know, without telling anyone, I'm sure a lot of it. Which yeah, is and... why, which is why they kept it such a secret, is because I mean, for from the United States perspective, and probably from the government's perspective, and many of those European nations, the idea was that um, not being able to fly those over those countries would have threatened our ability to promise mutually assured destruction, and course, would we... essentially threaten the safety of the you know the whole world. At the time, most of those countries, we were we were paying quite a lot of their defense budget. And you can see why their defense establishment, you know, didn't want to, it knew that politically it would be troublesome, but also, you know, that, that was their, you know, method of, you know, supporting their service. Uh, yeah. and, and it's not, I mean, it's not just that. It, uh, Francis Gary Powers, U2, actually was supposed to land in Norway when it, when it came over. That's where it was supposed to land. And, and uh, they certainly weren't telling the people of Norway that we were flying uh, surveillance flights over the Soviet Union and fueling those in, in Norway. Uh, and, yeah, because and, that... Yeah, it, I can see why the Norwegians might have been like, "Hey, well, that's, because that the puts Soviets, us in the an Soviets, once they shot it down, the Soviets then said to Norway, that's you know, that's an act of war, and, they, and so Norway was at risk. Uh, and so you can see why, you know, we believe these things are very important to security, and uh, but we have to work with allies who see that they have to work with us. If maybe they share our strategic vision, or maybe they just want you know money. Uh, but you can see how they are shy to. Uh, you know, let their own public, and when the stuff comes out, then everybody's everybody's you know scrambling for cover. We saw that in the Siganella incident. Uh, uh, we saw that it, they ended up having to uh, uh, land a uh, spy plane there in Norway afterwards, an SR seventy one, and Norway was scared of it because they got in so much trouble over the U two, which apparently those U two flights had gone on quite a lot. I'm telling everybody, so we see it in Palomares, and you know we had been over flying lots of countries that probably didn't like that we over flew. The other one I haven't gotten to, too, is that uh, we had a similar incident. The last one on, on Palomares that I didn't talk about because I wanted to do a whole episode on it was at the at the base in at Thule in, in Greenland. And it, it, it melted all the way through the ice and went to the bottom of the ocean, and we had to go fish it out with a, with a submarine. Uh, and uh, uh, so, I, the, you know, many of these, uh, 
it's very clear that if the public knew what was going on, they would didn't want to stop it. And, you know, maybe one of the advantages uh, that a totalitarian state like the Soviet Union had is that if Tajikistan didn't want them flying their nuclear missiles over them, they didn't care. If you want to talk about differences between East and West or whatever, I mean, maybe that was part of the difference is that we had to be secretive where the Russians could simply be authoritarian. I mean, it seems all crazy to talk about it now. And it, you know, there's still risk, I guess, still involved. But uh, I mean, it's hard to deny mutually assured destruction because the only way you know if it works is if you don't nuke each other. And we didn't. And we didn't. And I, now now people will question how much either side wanted to at the time i think both of us both sides oh yeah yeah we didn't trust each other in a way that was, that was insane what was that old sting yeah. song about if the russians love their children too uh and yeah, you know I, yeah it was because i don't think well i mean if you look at the experience in the second world war you can see you, you know 20 million russians died so it was easy to say no the russians don't love their children i don't care if they kill 20 million or 100 million russians i'll just make more russians uh and i mean it was easy to see that in the west it really was it was easy yeah. to see this evil intent uh, and, you know, they're everywhere. They're people. They don't want to die. They don't want their people to die. And and we found that out. Uh, uh, we found that out after Abel Archer, really, was that uh, yeah. is that they both sides were amazed that the other side would imagine that either side would nuke them. And, and I mean, so they both didn't trust the other side, but they were stunned that the other side wouldn't trust them. I, I, there was a, interesting, I mean, we've we talked over so many episodes, but uh, there was uh, the Japanese pilot that bombed Washington State with his with his firebombs during the Second World War uh, ended up coming back to that little town that he bombed. Uh, and, and he said afterwards, he said, if we just talked to each other like human beings, we never would have fought this war because they ended up forming this very close relationship. Uh, and, you know, we found out, you know, these people that you can vilify during the war, you find out that these were, they didn't want to kill, they didn't want to be killed. They were killing because they thought their that their life was at risk, uh, and so I, I I mean I there's a lot of lessons to read from history, and, and you know what a lessons you know possibly is uh, that we don't need all the world tension that we have, you know that so many yeah. times we found out in the historical events uh, that we were overreacting in a way that was unnecessary. So, I mean I I don't mean to you know, make any current political statement out of that at all, except to say that maybe history tells us that. Uh, we don't need to risk the world in order to protect the world, you know, and maybe we'll as move past as, that. As much as we think we do. Yeah. Uh, I do. I mean, I remember in the in the book, and I, I can't remember exactly how much you go over it in the video, but it. I remember them talking about the fact that if the bomb did go off, that because of like the prevailing winds and stuff like that, it would have thrown fallout over all of Europe. And like it would have been particularly disastrous but like you said uh, we we talk about that you know when these when these nuclear accidents happen but even what one of the ones at palomares hit the ground and it blew up the conventional stuff that was i but and yet still there was no way for the actual nuclear bomb to go off uh, the radioactive material was there but there was no way for it to yeah, i mean it's explode. a point to make because we we get that in comments all the time and yeah, they are they are designed to explode in a very specific set of circumstances in a very specific way. And the 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 the, pit, the, the part that's supposed to cause a detonation is not even inserted into the bomb until you until you are at risk of, of of having to drop the bomb. So I mean that's all supposed to be impossible. Uh, but I do want to say to people sometimes, you went into your physics class and they said oh, a nuclear bomb couldn't explode by accident. Many of these accidents are occurring before we put in the safeguards of things that we've learned. Uh, and so stuff yeah. that you might have been told was impossible was was possible in a bomb in in 1970 or 1960 those bombs had very different sorts of fail safes on them uh, and and uh, if you want to say oh it still couldn't have gone off and you're saying that all those fail safes fail safes that we added we made a significant change in the in the rules in 1992 and decommissioned a lot of bombs that didn't meet those standards you're saying that those 1992 standards were absolutely unnecessary if you want to say something pre-1992 could not have had an accident uh, and so I, I do think sometimes even the people that kind of lecture us uh, and, and probably people who have more technical experience than I do, I think sometimes they're being a bit naive when they try to argue that it was impossible. But truly from yeah. Palomar's, the worst case scenario, there was never there was never a risk that one of those could uh, get to nuclear detonation because they didn't the pieces weren't inside the, the missile or inside the bomb. But truly the worst case scenario is what happened, and that is you do have conventional explosives that are packed around a material that is highly toxic, uh, that, I mean, can be toxic, you know, in atoms, uh, and you are spreading that over a large space. 
and and, yeah. and 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 that's terrible. But obviously, you know, if a, if the bomb had gone off and the fallout, whatever, there is there is no good scenario to we accidentally you know detonated a nuclear bomb. And it's amazing over all these years, over sometimes hanging on to equipment that you know we were hanging on to stuff on both sides too. The Soviets too. I mean, they were putting yeah. out submarines that should never have gone to sea. Uh, full of nuclear missiles, and it's amazing in all of that, and all the horrible things have happened. Submarines have blown up and sunk, and and bombs have fallen out of missiles have gotten stuck in the mud, and they, you know airplanes have fallen <laughs> from the lost. sky. And we have never accidentally detonated a nuclear bomb. I, I, you know, every nuclear bomb that's ever been detonated on Earth was detonated on purpose. Uh, and and that you know that does say something both for how difficult it actually is to create that chain reaction. Really, the the largest civil engineering project in world history was to figure out how to make a nuclear bomb blow up, the Manhattan Project. I don't know how that compares to like the Great Wall of China. It was the largest, at least in U.S. history. Uh, and so I mean, it's 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 astoundingly difficult to do, and and that shows in the fact that it hasn't happened. But it also shows that we all apparently did love our children enough that we built in a whole lot of safeguards. Uh, so that uh, whether by someone you know panicking and pulling the trigger, or by it falling you know by mistake out of an airplane, it's never actually happened. Uh, so that we didn't have to test you know what does that mean in terms of you know how far it would go. So it is. I mean, I think you just kind of got to when you do these episodes, you got to talk about oh if it had gone off, this is what it would have done, so that you understand the risk involved. Uh, but uh, yeah, the fact that it never has says that I mean no, the, the, you know there you're talking the you know, the worst case possibility. Uh, and it has to be an extremely remote possibility because it's just that's never happened. Magellan TV is sponsoring this episode. And as always, we'd really like to thank them for making this podcast possible and for sponsoring both episodes of the podcast and the YouTube channel. As we usually do on the podcast, we like to talk about what documentaries you've been watching lately. Uh, you know, there, there's plenty. And I have to say that there's far more there than I have time to watch. I mean, I, I have never, I don't run in fear. I'm going to run out of things to watch in Magellan. But we, we recently did an episode, or I, I recently wrote an episode about uh, giraffes in China. And that had me looking at some kind of wildlife episode. So the one I stumbled on is called Wild and Wooly, an amazing friendship between sheep and elephant. Uh, and <laughs> the truth is stranger than fiction. And that, that description is actually what went on. They had an orphan elephant. It was totally adopted by the sheep. And it helped them uh, to, to raise the elephant. It is, uh, it's delightful, it's interesting, uh, and it is, I mean, it's one of those stories that you, you can't imagine that it's real except that it is. And uh, that's, that's always a fun thing in documentaries, but it shows the breadth of stuff that you can get on Magellan TV, that you can flip to something like that. You see that title and you got to watch it, right? I mean, how do you, how do you not watch that? Well, and something so specific is that they've got such a broad collection. They've got thousands of documentaries, and they're I'm seriously all high quality. Every everyone I've watched, they they don't feel dated. They feel high quality in terms of the the writing and the it's the run it's run by and filmmakers everything. and they want to have good product. I, I, we'll have people say that sometimes. Really, everyone is worth watching, and I have to honestly say, I have never started watching what and then not watched it through because I thought it was you know thought it wasn't worth watching. Every every time I come to one. It always turns out to be something that's really, really interesting. Yeah, I was actually watching one of the interesting things that has happened in history is the Tunguska event. And this is where a very, very large explosion happened over the Siberian wilderness. This talks about a lot of the, it talks about some of the theories. Some of the theories are absolutely crazy, <laughs> is what happens when we're really not 100% sure what happened. They think the prevailing opinion is that it was uh, some kind of uh, asteroid. Yeah, so a big rock yeah. comes to the atmosphere, it builds up a bunch of pressure on the front of the rock, uh, and yeah. that, that differential in pressure can just cause it to explode like a big nuclear bomb. There's some really interesting theories about it. And so this kind of has all these different scientists of discipline, various disciplines kind of talking about what could yeah, happen. Yeah, it's, it's like there. we were just talking about with the, with the nuclear bombs. You can't not talk, you can't talk about the Tunguska blast and not talk about those theories, uh, even though most, uh, you know, hopefully yeah. they're going to discount them out. It would be a different sort of place than Magellan if they're going to say there was aliens that were shooting at yes. the Tunguska. You know, quite honestly, as crazy as some of those theories sound, I mean, we've we've seen some stuff that apparently that's how it happened, and it was crazy. I mean, the sheep raised yeah. an elephant in that one. So, and so that's I mean, that's part of why we love Magellan TV is that there is always something on there, and it is going to be it's going to make you think. It's going to be interesting. Uh, if you are a listener or a watcher of the History Guy, you can always get a special deal if you go to try.magellantv.com slash History Guy. We usually have some kind of deal up there. It'll be something like a free month. It changes so wherever. Depending on what time you go up there, the deal might be different. Sometimes it's something like 30% off an annual membership. But if you go to try.magellantv.com slash history guy, you'll get access to that. And both of us really recommend it. 
Up next, the History Guy is going to talk about when a dropped wrench nearly set off a nuclear bomb in Arkansas. And stay tuned after the episode to hear us chat a little more with the History Guy. 1980 was an interesting time in American history. Jimmy Carter was president, although it was a presidential election year. Inflation was a national concern, over 13%. Changes in miniaturization technology meant that a number of consumer items were available for the first time, for example, VHS recorders, personal camcorders, and fax machines. Pac-Man was first introduced in arcades in 1980, and post-it notes went on sale for the first time in 1980. In 1980, Mount St. Helens erupted, and in 1980, Iran and Iraq went to war. And on September 19, 1980, near the tiny town of Damascus, Arkansas, a Titan II intercontinental ballistic missile topped with the largest thermonuclear warhead in the U.S. strategic nuclear arsenal exploded. Yeah, you heard me right. The missile exploded, but the warhead did not. And to understand what happened in the 1980 Damascus Titan II explosion, first we have to understand what was in the silo. The Titan rocket family is a family of expendable rockets built by the Glenn L. Martin Company and first introduced with the Titan I in 1959. The Titan I was the first multi-stage intercontinental ballistic missile in the U.S. inventory. In use from 1959 to 1965, the primary limitation of the Titan I is that the fuel could not be stored at room temperature and thus could not be stored in the rocket. To launch, the rocket had to be moved up from the silo and fueled, and that made it slow to launch. The Titan I was replaced by the Titan II, which used storable propellants, allowing it to be stored fueled and making it much faster to launch. It could actually be launched from its silo in less than 60 seconds. It was larger, 50% larger than a Titan I, but carried more than double the payload, a greater distance, with more accuracy. Although designed as an intercontinental ballistic missile, a dozen of the Titan II rockets were used as part of the Gemini manned space program in the 1960s. As an intercontinental ballistic missile, the Titan II carried the W-53 thermonuclear warhead. The W-53 weighed about 8,100 pounds and had a yield of about 9 megatons. Now to put that in perspective, a 9 megaton explosion would be the equivalent of about three times the energy of all the explosives used throughout the entirety of the Second World War, including the nuclear bombs at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The fireball alone from a 9 megaton explosion would have been enough to cause fatal burns to any unprotected human within 20 miles of the blast. Although we briefly fielded a larger airdropped thermonuclear bomb, the 25 megaton B-41, the W-53 was, in 1980, the largest thermonuclear device still in the American arsenal, and the largest ever mounted by the United States on a missile. A total of 63 Titan II intercontinental ballistic missiles with W-53 warheads were in service with the U.S. Strategic Air Command between 1963 and 1987. With missiles on continuous alert during that period in silos in Arizona, Kansas, and with the 308th Strategic Missile Wing in Arkansas. The fuel that allows you to store a Titan II missile fully fueled is a mix of hydrazine and dinitrogen tetroxide. It's called a hypergolic propellant. These types of fuels use two components, a fuel and an oxidizer, which ignite when they come into contact. Now, the advantage of hypergolic propellants is that they can be stored in liquid form at room temperature, and they can be easily and reliably ignited. And the Titan II is a two-stage rocket, which means it's got two different pieces, each with its own supply of fuel and oxidizer. The downside of hypergolic propellants is that the chemicals used are corrosive and extremely toxic to humans. In fact, a propellant leak in August of 1978 in a silo outside of Rock, Kansas, killed two Air Force personnel due to the toxicity of the chemicals. And the dangers of the poisonous and explosive chemicals became quite clear the night of September 18, 1980, in the Titan II Launch Complex 374-7 in northern Arkansas, approximately 50 miles from Little Rock. 
At 6.30 p.m., an airman who was part of a team doing a routine pressure check on the second stage of the missile accidentally dropped the socket from a three-foot-long ratchet. The approximately eight-pound socket head dropped some 80 feet, bounced off a thrust mount, and struck the rocket's first stage, piercing its skin and causing it to leak Aerozine 50 fuel. This is not good. Not only is Aerozine 50 highly toxic, creating this brown acetic smoke, but if it comes in contact with its oxidizer, it will explode. And as the fuel was leaking from the lower stage of the rocket, that meant that the weight of the rocket could have caused it to collapse in on itself, causing both stages to explode inside the silo. And that raises an interesting question. Could that have caused the thermonuclear warhead to detonate? A nuclear warhead does include conventional explosives, combined in what is called an explosive lens as part of the process of detonation. And heat may cause those to explode by accident. And while the explosives used on the older W-53 warhead were somewhat more vulnerable to heat than those used today, the missile was what was called one-point safe, meaning that the explosion of only one of the explosive components could not cause detonation. The missile design required extremely precise timing for the explosion of its high explosive components in order to produce a nuclear yield, and that's practically impossible for that to happen by accident. But why a fire could not really cause the missile to explode like a thermonuclear bomb, it could cause the warhead to explode and spread its radioactive material all over northern Arkansas. And in fact, that was a greater risk with the older W-53 warhead because it lacked a modern safety component called a fire-resistant pit that all missiles today would have and that is specifically designed to reduce plutonium dispersal in the case of a fire. A second risk comes from the electronic components that are designed to detonate the missile. Modern safety measures include something called Enhanced Nuclear Detonation Safety, or ENDS. This involves the enclosure of detonation-critical components in a barrier to prevent unintended energy sources from powering or operating the weapon's functions. Since 1993, Congress has required that every American missile design include not one, but two barriers in order to prevent accidental detonation. But the W-53 predated that rule and did not include an ENDS barrier. In 1993, Department of Energy Deputy Assistant Secretary for Military Application Winford Ellis noted of the stockpiled B-53 warheads, which operate the same way as the W-53 missile warhead, that the weapon has no assured level of nuclear safety in a broad range of multiple abnormal environments. And the Titan II in Launch Complex 374-7 was about to be subject to extreme abnormal environments. While an accidental thermonuclear detonation was an extremely remote possibility, understand that this was a very old missile design and it lacked all three of the critical safety components that Congress since 1993 has required of American nuclear missiles, an ENDS system, insensitive high explosives, and a fire-resistant pit. And the crews responding to the crisis in the silo had to be operating under the assumption that there was at least a possibility of a thermonuclear detonation. An emergency response team was dispatched, but just as two members of that team had been sent in to vent the gas from the silo, the missile exploded. It is possible that the missile had simply collapsed, but some experts argue that a fan that was activated to try to vent the fuel sparked the explosion. That initial explosion was so powerful that it blew the 740-ton missile silo door at the top 200 feet in the air, and ejected the second stage with the thermonuclear warhead still attached, at which point the second stage proceeded to explode. At this point, we need to pause for a moment to bring up an interesting interlude. At the time, United States Air Force policy did not allow the Air Force to either confirm nor deny whether there was a nuclear warhead at an accident site to the point where the United States Air Force initially refused to tell the sitting Vice President of the United States, Walter Mondale, who was in Little Rock, Arkansas for the Arkansas Democratic Convention with then Arkansas Governor Bill Clinton, whether the missile that looked like it was about to explode just 50 miles away in Damascus had a nuclear warhead. In fact, the county sheriff who was in charge of the evacuation only found out that there was a thermonuclear warhead involved because he searched with his radio until he found the Air Force frequency and eavesdropped on their conversation. The explosion threw the warhead some hundred feet outside the complex's front gate, but the warhead released no radiation. 
The two critical response team members who were closest to the silo when the missile exploded took terrible injuries in the explosion, and sadly, one of them, senior airman David Livingston, died of his injuries. He died a hero trying to prevent a disaster. 21 other people who were nearby when the missile exploded also were injured in that explosion. The explosion pretty much destroyed the facility, but the demolition and cleanup still cost the Air Force about another $20 million, and the site where that silo once was is now private land and on the National Register of Historic Places. The Titan missile program was already towards the end of its lifespan in 1980, and it was discontinued, and the last of the Titan missiles was decommissioned in 1987. But there is still one Titan missile silo, complete with a deactivated Titan II missile that the public can go view at the Titan Missile Museum in Arizona. It's kind of funny that from 1980 that we remember Pac-Man and Post-it notes more than an intercontinental ballistic missile blowing up, but I guess the Damascus Titan II silo missile explosion is about as well remembered as top-loading VCRs. Which leaves a final question. Could this accident happen again today? The short answer is no. We have much safer designs today, and the United States no longer uses liquid-fueled intercontinental ballistic missiles. But the more complex answer is that what really happened in Damascus in 1980 was an unexpected series of events for which the Air Force was unprepared. And yes, unexpected things still happen today. I think, like we mentioned in the last one, accidents happen to everybody. And when you've just got so many different places where we're working with nuclear missiles, I mean, we had a ton of nuclear missile silos, like the one in Damascus. You're, people are working every day, and people are going to have accidents. Although, I think we would all like to think that you can't drop a wrench and set off a nuclear missile, which is why this, which is what makes this one so interesting. If you think, and it's interesting because you can actually go see a Titan silo in Arizona now, the Titan Missile Museum, which is really worth your time. I, I love that museum. Uh, but you can see how uh, easy it would be if you look at how you had to do maintenance on that tall silo looking down at the missile. That's, I mean, it was the, the, the actual metal on the missile is the thickness of a dime. Uh, and you, you got it, essentially, you've got two chemicals in there that if they touch each other, they explode. That's the whole point, right? Uh, yeah. and, and so if you, you know, you, you can, when you see how it happened, you're like, ah. So, I mean, there was, there was a, a comedy of errors involved. I don't know if comedy is the right term, but, I mean, they had brought the wrong wrench. Uh, and then, you know, he dropped the end of a socket wrench. Uh, you think about a socket wrench like you're working on your car. This is like a nine-pound socket. And when yeah. you look, you can see if that drops down and bounces. And, it, of course, it would have to bounce exactly wrong. Uh, and you can imagine that, but uh, you, when you think about the opportunity, the number of times that they were going to do maintenance on these missiles that are filled with toxic chemicals that are have to be ready to launch at a moment's notice, uh, but are sitting there sometimes decades at a time too. And you know, equipment, you know, it gets rusty. Fighters getting that stuff. That you know, they were working on those things all the time. So the fail safes on the system that would make it virtually impossible for even a, a rogue crew to launch a missile are absolutely extraordinary. Uh, yeah. But the, the risk that just the fact that you mechanically have something that's built to blow up a huge chunk of the earth sitting in there for decades at a time is actually a more realistic risk. And it was yeah. before the it was before those changes that we made in the 90s in terms of, of safety risks. Uh, so I, when, you, when you look at it, say, I mean, these, could, these were people absolutely their best intent to do the best job that they possibly could. They're doing the stuff day in and day out. And, you know, what are, what are the odds that at some point in that, someone's going to drop a wrench. I mean, gosh, what are the odds that they wouldn't at some point have dropped a wrench yeah. in one of those silos? My guess is that that was not the first and probably not the last wrench that was ever dropped in a missile silo. Yes. It's just that this was the one that happened one to bounce. It bounced the... wrong. There were other accidents involving Titan missile silos, too, that caused deaths uh, because of toxic chemicals and, and, and things like that. So uh, this there I was mean, one at this at this silo, wasn't there, that, where it was leaking? It was, uh, uh, it was in, uh, not this silo. It was in this uh, it was in this uh there's they're like come in pods and sections and it was oh, in the okay. same sort of section and i think that one was during construction i might be wrong i might be misquoting there but uh, i mean if you look at all complexity going on in there uh, you can see that you know there could no matter how careful you are about all the security and safety measures and stuff like that i mean simply you know places of work people are going to have accidents I mean, it's just going to happen. Well, and again, like with the Palomares incident, the reason that this one really makes history is because it ended up being essentially worst case scenario. It, it, it wasn't, though, in that the, the missile exploded, but the, the warhead did not. I mean, not just not detonate. I mean, the, even the even the, uh, the, the 
explosive, high explosive element inside of it didn't blow up. So this could have been like Palomares. It could have been, you know, without yeah. detonating the missile, it could have simply blown up and, and, and contaminated a you know, large chunk of Arkansas with radioactive material. That wouldn't have gotten down to Little Rock where they were holding the convention or anything like that. You literally would have had to have a detonation for it to be a real risk yeah. to anybody and you'll blow down wind into them or something like that. But it certainly could have been far worse. Uh, and it, even though it was very remote, I mean, you're still talking at least many tens of thousands of people who could have been had, yeah. you know, potentially lethal, lethal exposure to radiation. And again, they're not even, the only way the sheriff knew it was going on is that they, they knew what Broken Arrow meant, that someone heard it on the radio. <laughs> and probably the biggest lesson they learned from it is to use a different channel so that the, the local law enforcement <laughs> can eavesdrop on your conversations. I imagine that you know that from from the military's perspective, you don't want that to get out to the news if you can help it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, they're saying they're saying, oh, we want to prevent a panic. But I mean, is there a point when you want to panic, when you want to get people the heck out of there? And I mean, they, they don't seem to know. And, and whoever's in charge of talking is always going to have simply a rule, no matter what, no matter what the situation, I can't confirm or deny. And you saw that in the most extreme sense in, in Arkansas, because they were literally talking to the sitting vice president of the United States. And the guy said, I don't have authorization to tell you that. And that, I mean, that shows you how serious they were about that. Yeah. And was that, you know, was that policy to protect the public? Was that policy to protect the Air Force? Uh, it's, it's hard to say. Maybe a little bit of both. Um, but it's, it is interesting because, yeah, essentially no one involved, I mean, even the people involved in that and trying to deal with the crisis were, were not allowed to tell anybody about it. And I, I mean, I think that we do, they tried, they did their best at this one. And the people who are actually trying to deal with this crisis and incredibly dangerous, I, I mean, the folks who are trying to walk in, I'm mean, pretty much essentially right as the missile actually explodes. I mean, there is some serious bravery when you know Absolutely. you're going yeah. into yeah that recovery uh, team, and they they weren't necessarily treated well by the Air Force or the or the press, but that recovery team, I mean, those are people that were truly risking their lives and 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 some sacrificed their lives to uh, or one of them did to try to prevent this explosion. And they think, I mean, there's several different explanations, but they think they, they decided they wanted to try to vent the gas and they turned on a fan to vent the gas. And I think the fan might've been what sparked the explosion. So you can imagine sitting around and trying to make that decision because no one's got a book yeah. for, for exactly what's going on here. Uh, but they know if that all drains out, that missile will not be able to sustain its own weight if it's not full and it's all gonna collapse in on itself and then you're gonna get the same explosion. And yeah. boy, the force of that, you know, the fact that it lifted this, you know, multi-ton door. I mean, it's a door that's built to withstand being attacked by a Soviet nuclear bomb. And it blew that sucker 40 feet up in the air and, you know, yeah. threw the missile out. I mean, it really shows oh, you the forces that are involved. And that's, that's, broke the one guy's uh, leg. that's another one where, as a matter of fact, I remade this video at one point to talk more about, you know, what was the real risk of a nuclear explosion because there was a lot of discussion on it on the channel. And I'm not a physicist. It wasn't necessarily my area of specialty. But I can say that as Schlossinger in his book says that he spoke to people that designed the bomb. And they said that there was absolutely a risk of detonation with this bomb. And it has to do with that fact that they hadn't added some of these safeguards that were later added in 92. That's the reason that we ended up uh, decommissioning these missiles. Uh, in that there were simply so many forces in there and not just explosive force, because it's built so that you can't just, you know, blow up a piece and have it, you know, go through the chain of reaction. But electrical forces, I mean, the bottom line is this thing is built so that at some point it can detonate. And you are hitting a point where you've got, uh, 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 you're affecting electromagnetic forces and electrical forces and surge forces. And you're like literally melting the, uh, the, the circuit board uh, where there is actually a possibility uh, that the, the sequence of events that it's designed to do could be triggered. Uh, because wow. you know, at some point you got to be able to turn on the missile, right? And so yeah. that would be that would be almost impossible to do in the call in control room by accident because you got to have. I mean, it's it's incredible, but I mean, they had a, st a lot of stuff coming in from the outside to get whatever they needed to do to actually launch the missile. I mean, it, it's one, another reason to visit the Titan Missile Museum. It's really fascinating there. Uh, but uh, uh, but inside the missile, there still. I mean, this all comes down to you know you're triggering buttons there, and when you've got that many forces going on, you can't guarantee that that button won't be. So we added other protective measures since then, uh, and we wouldn't have added those if we didn't think there was a risk, right? So I mean, this this there's a there was actually a possibility by the people who designed the bombs saying that yes, this absolutely could have detonated. And all the people have come at me online and said there's no possibility this could have detonated. I think there's credible sources saying yes that it was that there was, that there, was a, there was a very real risk here. Uh, and again, the risk can be incredibly remote, but the consequence is so large that, I mean, even an incredibly remote risk is terrifying and unacceptable. 
Yeah, I think that, uh, well, and since they hadn't even told the vice president, if like, for instance, when it had exploded, they, I mean, there were people who would have been in danger who were not evacuated or anything like that. Um, and I, I don't know, maybe they wouldn't have had the time to evacuate it even if they had started. But I, I mean, yeah, I, mean, I can you see... going to evacuate Little Rock? I don't know. Yeah, right. I mean, how do you, how do we, how do you do that? Yeah, you have to think about it, though. That had, had that actually, de- had a, a nuclear bomb gone off? Everybody who would have faced a consequence for not telling the vice president would have been vaporized. <laughs> yeah, they probably wouldn't have had to worry so much about that. <laughs> what are you going to do so... to me, Fritz Mondale? Because if, if I'm lying to you, then I'm dead. <laughs> I, and I know that I was, I was reading some stuff uh, before we went into this, and it, it was talking about kind of how we did change some stuff in terms of how we talk about with some civilian leadership and how we deal with those crises and stuff like that. You can see why after the fact, if there was a real chance of this blowing up, while some civ- where civilians would be like, and you didn't tell us, you didn't think that was that was worth worth mentioning. Better not. To I can know. see it from the military side too, where they're like, I mean, if we panic, everybody send everybody out, and then nothing happens. I mean, they're going to get a lot of crap either way, right? People are not going to be happy with them, and uh, and and they might not accomplish anything he might not even get people out in time anyway you know i think to, to an extent their fingers are crossed but i mean we've seen that I mean, we've seen this in several of the episodes that we talked about when you go back and do the research and on often you get these exact same complaints local officials civil defense officials were simply left in the dark that happened in the Beaumark accident in, in in new jersey that happened in the grand forks fire up in in, in north dakota uh that happened in the palomares incidences they were they were not telling or not the palomares but the crumdom incidents uh, that they they weren't telling people, you know, what kind of plane crashed, exactly what it means that that plane crashed. This is again, you get the most extreme example here when they wouldn't even tell. I mean, who would they have told? They wouldn't tell the vice president. I mean, they, was it was one step higher if it was the president. Would they have told him, or, or would they have said the only person higher than that? Right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. And Jimmy Carter was a nuclear engineer. It sort of, you know, it, it commanded the nuclear submarine, so he would have had at least some idea what was going on. But would they have said, I can't tell you, Mr. President? You know, you know, who's going to make the decision? So it's it's interesting how we came to that and and uh, you know it's all secretive i mean it's it's not really clear when an order came down that said that you will never tell anybody no matter who they are you know the confirm or deny that there's a nuclear explosion in there and that that might, decision might have been made immediately after the second world war when we had a very different idea of you know how much we would were willing to risk uh, because we were at war and that you know that might have just carried through but it's fascinating when you hear themes through all of this because these accidents occurred for very different reasons. I mean, we've seen accidents where they were dismantling nuclear bombs. We've seen missiles where you know there was or accidents where there was a fire, whether there's a nuclear bomb. Or, uh, it's it's really interesting to say the thing the theme that runs through all of it is the officials will be stunningly dishonest, whether they're Soviet officials or American officials too. They will oh, just yeah. be they stunningly dishonest to you about what's well, going no one, on. No one wants to admit, and I think this is, i it's easy to understand it. No one wants to admit that, yeah, there was a nuke and we we messed up. <laughs> I know it, no one wants to say that because, and even if it's, even if nothing, you know, ultimately we didn't have a nuclear explosion go off, they still don't want you to believe that they could have because that's, I mean, that's enough to shake public trust in the whole, in the whole, in system, the whole yeah. concept. Yeah. And, and I think that we, I mean, we talked about it through, throughout this is that, yes, there there was apparently in general very little chance of these things going off and even in these these specific cases i, I mean a lot had to go wrong to get them to this point yeah. and so we're very careful with nuclear weapons which i think speaks reasonably well of us uh, for something as dangerous as it, as as a nuclear weapon that we we take that seriously even if we're it, not it going to tell you about it. It also speaks highly of our armed forces. And there's, I mean, there's, yeah. there's, there's numerous ways that you can serve. Uh, I mean, but these people, I mean, they knew that they were a, a line of defense and what they saw as a defense of the nation and of, of the, the world. Uh, and they knew that if it came to it, that they, uh, you know, that they were going to have to put themselves at risk and put their families at risk and uh, do something that normal humans might not want to do. And, you know, they, uh, they sacrifice for us. And so I, I think it, it speaks very highly of the, of the tens of thousands of, of men and women that were involved in, in uh, over uh, the decades of, and still now, but I mean, in nuclear silos, on nuclear planes, on nuclear submarines, taking care of all these bases and, 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 and the maintenance and all that sort of stuff, how safe they've actually kept us. Thank you for listening to this episode of the History Guy podcast. 
We hope you enjoyed these stories of forgotten history, and if you did, you can find more on our YouTube channel at The History Guy, History Deserves to be Remembered. We will continue to release podcasts every other week, so stick around if you want more podcasts on forgotten history. You can also find us on our website, thehistoryguy.net, as well as on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Rumble, and Patreon. You can even get a personalized message from the History Guy himself on Cameo. 